people I know. What'd you say, Anna? I see people I know. Yes. Even better. Okay, probably a few people will still be coming in. Um, and Elisa, lucky you, I'm gonna make you co-host. So now Anna, Aaron, and Elisa are co-hosts. If I'm talking, you can let people in. Um, again, welcome. It's so nice to see everyone. And I continue to be pleasantly surprised every time we do COSI that, um, that our community is still showing up for this. So thank you. I'm Katie Victor. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a faculty librarian at Central. Um, just wanna let everyone know we're recording. You should have gotten that message when you signed on. Um, there are captions available. And if anyone needs um, help getting captions to show up and or other accommodations, you can let me know in the chat. You can direct message me in the chat. So let's see, did I cover everything? Access, yep, okay. Again, welcome to COSI. I'm so glad you're here. COSI stands for Conversations on Social Issues. Today will be a conversation. Um, Aaron Steinke and Anna Shaver are here with questions and a topic hopefully everyone has buy-in on, which is grades and grading. Um, COSI has been happening at Central for over 11 years, and I do want to thank the forebearers of COSI, Kelly McHenry, um, who's a librarian at Central and still works part-time, and Kimberly Tate Malone, who's now a full-time librarian up at North. Uh, COSI wouldn't be here if it weren't for those two. And let's see, what else do I want to say? Okay, I think I will just say again, that the presenters today, Erin Steinke and Anna Shaver, are English faculty at Central um, and have both been doing a lot of really dedicated and amazing work um, picking apart uh, traditional grades, grading, and assessment. And so I'll turn it over to them and um, hope that we will be in conversation. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, if you have comments in the chat, I'll kind of call them out or you can raise hands. We've all done this a million times. Okay, Anna and Aaron, thank you so much for your time in preparing for this and over to you. Thank you, Katie. Um, and we are so excited to be here to have this conversation with you all. I just wanted to especially thank, I'm seeing some of my students, current and former, and um, I know many of Anna's students are here too, and we're just especially grateful that you all chose to join today. Just we we love to hear from our students and um, this work that we're playing with, <laughs> trying to figure out how to make grading better, how to make it fair, how to make it less less inequitable, um, is all for you. So it matters to us a lot that you're here. Um, so I'm Erin Steinke. This is my friend and colleague Anna Shaver. Um, we're both teaching English 101, English 102, um, and other, other literature and creative writing classes for the college. And we're just wanting to, Anna, do you want to say anything before we jump into kind of our initial overview? Just what you said, and just to say hi, and I'm really happy to see my students here, and I hope that we can have a lot of discussion mostly. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. We're, um, we'll be well, we're going to kind of just do a short overview of sort of what what the situation is <laughs> with grading, why we're trying, why Anna and I are trying to do something different. Also, I just wanted to say we're not the only faculty who are trying to do different things with grading. So just know that we are a couple people. There are many. Um, and so just know that this is something that many faculty feel a lot of real sincere concern around. Um, but we wanted to give a quick overview of like where we're coming from and then some things that Anna and I are each trying out in our classes as we're trying to figure out how to do grading better. So if you can um, move to the overview slide, Anna, for me. Yeah, and we're gonna, we'll talk about the things that we're trying, but there are like lots of other solutions people have 
proposed and tried. So our goal is not to be exhaustive with, with that focus. Yeah, thank you, absolutely. So just kind of to, to set the stage, um, there's been, a, there's a lot of research about what we are calling traditional grading. So by traditional grading, y'all know what I'm saying, right? The like typical percentages, points, A to F, you know, all of that, right? Um, but the research shows overall, I really like this quote from Alfie Cohn um, from his article, The Trouble with Rubrics. Research shows three reliable effects when students are graded. They tend to think less deeply, avoid taking risks, and lose interest in the learning itself. Those three things so just kind of happen over and over. And it makes total sense, right? I mean, maybe some of these students can identify with this, right? It's it's it becomes about the grade, right? It becomes less about the thing you're trying to learn, the thing you're you're playing with, the thing that might feel unfamiliar, right? And so it's about avoiding making mistakes so you don't get punished with a bad grade. And that makes total logical sense. And so I think, um, but that's really counterproductive <laughs> to what at least I want to do as a teacher um, in a classroom. Um, I'll go through some of these points that are, they appear over and over and over in studies, uh, but grades center extrinsic motivation rather than intrinsic motiv motivation, meaning that you're trying to like earn that external grade versus listening to what you're internally motivated by, what you want to learn about, what you naturally are curious about. Grades tend to measure a student's ability to follow instructions rather than their actual learning. And maybe some students here can identify with that in classes they've taken in the pandemic, where likely some of those courses were more confusing than normal because of the big pivot so many teachers were doing, both college and high school level. Um, and so if you did, if you get a good grade, often it's like because you could figure out how to do it, right? Like how to how to turn the thing in where it should be turned in and whatever. Um, grades discourage students from taking risks or trying new things because, again, for fear of receiving a punitive grade, safer to turn in the bland thing you know how to do and you think you'll, you know, get a good grade on and try something new. When feedback and grades are both present, students actually disregard the feedback. So if the grade is with the feedback, then it's almost like your brain will only look at the grade and kind of discards the feedback. It's not even purposeful. It's just a thing that like our brains do. <laughs> and so of course, for teachers spending lots of time giving feedback that they care about and they're like really invested in, this is discouraging news, right? <laughs> also, there's no clear consensus among faculty as to what grades really are, like what their purpose is. Um, some faculty feel like it's measuring learning. For some faculty, it's like a certain bar that means you can move on to the next thing in a sequence. Um, but faculty aren't in alignment on even what the grades do. And then finally, so this this is true of writing, like grading in writing classes in general, but um, there really is a particular issue with traditional grading as it supports white language supremacy in English classes. And so what we call standard academic English in the U.S. is based on local white dialects of English. So that might look different in Seattle for us than it does in the Midwest or than it does in the South. But it's typically whatever is the standard academic English is based on whatever local white dialect is in the area. And so because of that, students of color and multilingual students are almost always placed at a disadvantage, being graded on how closely they can perform like a racialized dialect of English that's not maybe their own race or ethnicity. Um, and so it just sets up a problematic basis from like day one. And then if anything you want to add to that, Anna? Yeah, I think that um, the thing that stands out to me as you go through all of those points and something that a lot of my students in my 101 class just even in the last week have been saying is that there's just they just feel so much fear. There's just so much fear that's connected to school and thinking about my time as a student in through all grades, basically, there is just a lot of fear and pressure. Um, and I think we, we have to have some kind of pressure to motivate us, but fear doesn't sound good to me. Um, so. I think that I've been, I think that we've all been needing a way to take off some of that pressure and reduce some of that, the fear. Thank Was you. Was there to say, Erin? Yeah, that's great. Go for it. I'll, uh, I see Allison's asking if the PowerPoint will be shared. I don't remember if we made it um, public yet, but I'll put the link in the chat as soon as I turn off the, the um, PowerPoint in a few minutes. And Katie's going to put it on the COSI page. So I'll talk a little bit about what I've been trying. Um, and first, I just want to say, like, 
kind of what some of my motivations were for trying this. Um, I've been wanting to try to find a way to have a more equitable, more anti-racist grading system for a while. Um, my background is in linguistics, and so my interest in language and what is what is my role as a linguist teaching an English class is something that I've thought a lot about, and also seeing the the bigger movements um, nationally to try to to make grading a more equitable practice. It's been really interesting to me, but um, a training that Aaron and I have been part of for the last couple of years, um, where I felt actually a lot of pressure personally to do things a certain way, um, combined with just the experience we all went through during the early, especially the first couple of years of the COVID pandemic, it just feels like people need a lot more flexibility and grace and nobody is in the same position as each other. So I think that whatever system we have going forward, it's going to need to incorporate a lot more flexibility and a lot more um, students being able to ask for what they need or, or get what they need. So that's those are kind of where I'm coming from. And um, I'm hoping that my new grading system, the one that I'm using or the one I'm adapting, will provide a sense of relief for students and take away some of that fear and anxiety. So uh, as part of this training that Aaron and I have been doing, um, we're supposed to apply uh, a new grading method to our English 101 classes. And my English 101 classes are all online asynchronous. Um, that's been that way pretty much the whole pandemic. I'll probably do in person again eventually, but so far they're all online and asynchronous. Um, and so part of my 101 classes is using a Discord server. Um, and that's where all of our discussions take place. Um, and one practice that came from the training Aaron and I did was to have either a contract or a grading agreement where uh, I will usually propose a certain set of um, common understandings or agreements about the kinds of work students should expect to do over the quarter and how that would correlate to a grade. For example, in my 101 class right now, um, to get an A, students would need to write the two papers, including two drafts, and go through the peer response process. They would need to um, write a journal every week and then complete some sort of uh, grammar or MLA or formatting or, or writing sort of exercise. And I give different options depending on people's preferences or, or needs. If they do 10 of those over the quarter, they also get an A, 10 of each of those and then participate to a certain level in the Discord discussions. So I think it's three posts uh, per week right now. So, and then if, if, they, if they're at the beginning of the quarter and they're like, I don't know if I can work at that level or, or put that much work into the class, they can choose to aim for more like a B or a C. And that would reduce, they would reduce the amount of work they put in to the class depending on the grade that they were personally aiming for. Um, and I make it clear at the beginning that Everyone has different needs um, and whatever grade they hope to earn, I will help them aim for that grade and hopefully achieve it. Um, that said, a lot of students aim for a B and do get an A. So that's, I'm always happy to do that. Um, another thing, so the, the class will negotiate together on the agreement and I will, I will agree to make changes if the class feels like something isn't going to work for them as a class that I have a dedicated discussion where people can continue to ask questions or um, make requests about the agreement. And I, I check in twice over the quarter to make sure it's working for everyone. Um, and then also students who feel like the agreement is more or less fair but isn't going to work exactly for them. Um, I make it clear to every student, I hope I do, um, that we can trade things out, we can we can exchange the kinds of work people do to make it fit their schedule or their um, neurodiver neurodiversity, neurodivergence more clearly, like whatever students need, we'll try to figure out the work that, that works for them um, so they're working at an equivalent level. Um, and so all of my assignments are graded as either complete, incomplete, or missing, and the points don't add up to anything. It's just they're just a marker of whether this whether the assignment was turned in or not. 
And also because of the way that I have uh, made a lot of the assignments, there are basically no due dates. There are some, there are due dates on the two major papers and the peer responses, and even those are pretty flexible. And then the rest of the work is kind of up to the students to track how much of it they've done. And that's, and then we, we discuss their work and, and discuss their final grade at the end. So there's nowhere that I'm actually keeping score um, of what's been submitted and what isn't submitted. They can, they can see the Canvas gradebook and it will show like what's missing and what isn't missing, but um, it's not gonna add up to a score. The score is arrived at by a discussion at the end of the quarter. Um, and the feedback, so this is the second, winter quarter is the second quarter I've done this. Um, and I, I have made changes in between the first and second quarters. The feedback has been really interesting because students usually the first two or three weeks of the quarter, they're actually a little bit more anxious because this feels really new and, and strange. And they're kind of like, what is going on? And um, I, I have conferences, especially in my 101 classes, um, a couple of weeks in where I can kind of like check in with students and make sure that everything's making sense. Um, and mostly students are saying, I think I understand the grading system and I think I'm doing everything, but it seems too like straightforward and easy. And I'm afraid there's something I'm missing. And so I get to have the really happy experience of telling students over and over the first two or three weeks, no, nope, you're actually doing everything right. Um, it's up to you to decide which things you want to do and how much you want to do. And I'm here to support you. And you don't need to worry about having your work be late or have it be missing. Um, it's kind of it's kind of up to you. And after week three, students are mostly pretty relieved. It's really nice as, a, as an instructor to like see students like and I, the conferences are on Zoom or on, on Discord. So I can actually see or talk to the students, like watch them feel relief. <laughs> and I had one student um, a couple of weeks ago in our conference. He was saying that the class felt really surreal um, and it was a huge relief. And he was he was commenting that as we were talking in our conference, he could feel the strain leaving his neck and shoulders, which I, th I think just a really good reminder of how like we hold stress in our bodies and like um, the ways we set up our classes are going to impact our students' health. Um, and so if we can support our students in those ways, I think that's something we should definitely do. Um, he said that traditional grading systems to him feel like a wall between him and his teachers. And he always has to like approach the wall and beg for his grade, but now he feels like there is, he has, he has a lot more direct control over his grade. And that's pretty consistent with the feedback that I've heard. There are definitely things that I'm going to keep changing and, and keep updating. Um, but overall, I, it's been pretty good experience, mostly. Now it's Aaron's turn. <laughs> Thank you. I was just, like, I really appreciated the story you shared about um, your student feeling like literally feeling the stress leave his body as he thought about the class. I'm like, that feels like a really great um, teaching goal. So yeah, I'm like, I've never been able to do that as a teacher. Never, never, never. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say, so I'm going to share some things that I'm trying this quarter. And at what I've been trying has changed every quarter. <laughs> so I, like it changes based on what my students tell me and it and like we try it and I'm like, oh, that was good, but this part didn't work out. And so we try something else. And so this is very iterative. Some of the changes I've made have also been based on um, sort of a cohort um, of, of faculty across the state that Anna and I have gotten connected to that are all kind of trying this trial and error together and learning from each other. And so there's things that I'll talk about in, in this kind of overview that are also from other faculty. So I just, I wanna kind of remove the mystique of like, this is not like me and Anna inventing things from nothing. This is a lot of sort of collaborative things that we've developed with other friends and other colleagues. So anyway, I tried, when I first started trying out um, alternative grading, I started with a labor-based, more, more traditionally labor-based contract grading system where students are choosing a grade they're gonna like aim for, they um, kind of, you know, semi-commit to that grade. There's check-ins throughout. Um, and it was, even that was much, much better than what I had done before. Like it was still, it was, it was a vast improvement. 
there was a lot more students trying things out creatively, taking risks, like less pressure on, like they knew what they knew they could like build a plan and get whatever grade they wanted. And it was totally up to them. And that felt really empowering. But I found there were some other issues that came up for me and with that system. Um, it ended up being, I found, even though I tried to scale back the the like work itself, the amount of work students were doing, they still were reporting. It just felt work heavy. And so I've been playing now a little more with what would fall under ungrading, the ungrading umbrella, which has lots of lots and lots of different um, avenues. What I've kept from labor-based grading was um, the piece of like collective whole class negotiation, which universally students talked about appreciating. And um, and so I've kept that part, which is part of labor-based um, grading. Um, and then mm, from there, I've played a lot with it. So all I'd say, I'm teaching online asynchronous right now. And um, the negotiating stuff is actually much easier done when you have a hybrid or <laughs> in-person class, in class, in my experience. But what I've tried this quarter is doing an unmonitored Google document for the early class discussion, which was an idea from a friend. And um, I, I like I put some questions and like starters, starter prompts in that Google Doc. And then like I tell the, the students and I like stick to it. I don't and I don't get involved. Then it's them talking back and forth in the doc. I don't like I don't touch it. I let it go. Once they're done with the discussion, then I, I read through it. And I created a Google survey based on the issues they raised, the things that they were debating about, like, you know, various class policies, and then the class votes, and we go with what the class decided. Um, we do another round of tweaks mid-quarter. Usually there aren't very many, but um, like one of my classes had one change in policy mid-quarter, the other one didn't. Um, and then also part of the agreement is always that a student has the option to make an individual plan with the instructor if needed. So if there are, you know, if it's one of those quarters and life happens in big ways, that student can always work with me directly to figure out how they're going to, you know, do what they need to do. So the feedback I've gotten is that students really like deciding together about how much work they need to complete for various final grades. Um, they like deciding on late work policies together. Um, and so I start class off with like a starter learning agreement that breaks the work into different categories. So there's some final writing projects, there are journals, there are, you know, like maybe four categories of work. And then how much of those categories has to be completed percentage wise at the end for each final grade level. Um, and then the work is assessed based on completion. There are some partial credit options um, that students have asked for. So I've incorporated that. So I do, I have moved to actually having like points for work completed versus not, just so that there could be some partial credit options for students. Um, but each class ends up with its own unique learning agreement um, that's voted on by the class. And there's no contracts in the class, which would be part of a traditional like labor-based system. Um, so I found like there's a lot so far, there's been, we'll see what my students say this quarter, um, but in the past, there's been a lot of positive feedback around students feeling empowered to set the own, their own terms for how they're being assessed. So like one of my students from fall quarter wrote about in his reflection, it felt really fair because students were determining, like because they set what different grade, they were determining what a grade meant for the class. An A meant this, a B meant that. Um, and then they could decide if an A was needed, if it was worth it for them um, or not. And they felt like because they were setting the terms, they were then, they then got to be accountable to their own terms. And they, that was really like something they appreciated. Um, one thing that I'm keep, I keep trying to work with um, that is, is a consistent challenge is figure, sometimes it can still be confusing to figure out final grades. Like for students, they have trouble telling, you know, like because it's not set up the way Canvas is set up for everything else, traditional grading, it can be hard to like, make sure it makes sense. So I'm continuing to work with like how to how to make sure that it doesn't feel there isn't any kind of increase in anxiety and not knowing or not being able to track in the same way. Um, so that's something I'm still playing with. And again, I like I keep every every quarter I learn and every quarter I change things. Um, and so I think it's just I don't think there's ever a place where we're done. You know, maybe the most equitable thing of, at all, of all would be we don't have to deal with grading. <laughs> you know, um, I think that would be better. But our college doesn't enable that option at this point. So it's, it's really a lot of these. I think of them as like their interventions. It's trying something different that hopes to alleviate an issue. But right now we can't quite unearth 
the whole problem because we can't get rid of the the grading system as a whole right now. But um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to say like it, it's a process and I keep learning and I learn along with my students. I learn from their experiences. Um, and so that's this is what we've been doing this quarter. But we wanted to we wanted to move on um, to kind of open up some some questions and dialogue. We don't want to just be talking at the whole time. And also um, wanted to leave space. I guess this is these questions are are intended to be oriented both for faculty and for students. Um, talking about like we'd love to hear from you about what grades feel like, um, how you react to being graded, and what your experience has been like with them. Um, and then also what functions do grades fill? If you replace that traditional system, what would a new assessment or grading system need to do from your perspective? And so um, both from faculty, staff, and student perspectives, we'd love to open this up. Yes, thank you. And we should say Aaron and I both teach English. It was originally, we were going to originally have faculty from other departments part of this, and it just kind of ended up being mostly English. So we have, we've put a lot of thought into how this works for English classes, but we don't know as much about how other disciplines or other um, fields would, would do something like this. So I'm wondering if maybe we can put the questions in the chat so that those are there to see. Um, yeah, totally. I'm seeing Katie's comment about um, other faculty here are doing similar work. So yeah, this can be, this is really an open space. We have some questions that we would love to hear experiences. We're happy to take questions if folks have questions about what either myself or Anna are doing. And also we would love um, to hear from other faculty about what they're trying out, um, from students about what their experiences have been. Honestly, like in Anna in my class, again, like these are these are not systems that are perfect. So there's no need to be like, oh, it's, it's perfect. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> Norris, thank you. Go ahead. Um, you asked what grades feel like. Um, I just remembered always being afraid in school because of the the grades and um, even in college. And I remember studying so hard and just couldn't um, on certain classes, in certain classes, not being able to get the grade that I thought I needed because of the way the test was given. But if I could talk it out, I did really well. Or if it was essay, I, I would do um, well, but it was a lot of multiple choice. So I was thankful that when I went to graduate school, it was either you passed it or you didn't. And so that works for me. And I'm liking this idea about no grades because I'm familiar, very familiar with Alfie Cohn. Um, he's the one that speaks about why you shouldn't say good job and that students need to um, feel good from the inside out versus from the versus what I'm telling them as an instructor. And I also agree with him about not having homework but the system doesn't allow for it. So the other part, the question I wanted to know is like, how do how do we get around Canvas since all three campus and everybody else use Canvas? Thank you. Thank you, Norris, so much. That's um, the question you ask about Canvas <laughs> has been a little bit the bane of my existence, <laughs> trying out these new things. Um, like, man, so much of I feel like so much brain power has been like, how do we how do we short circuit Canvas? What's a workaround for this? How can we, you know, um, it's not really. Yeah, Canvas is not set up well for alternative grading systems and so and I think that's where for me anyway as I've tried out these things where a lot of the confusion comes in is because like you know I know Anna and I have at various times even had to like block the final what the final grade appears to be because it's confusing and it's not actually accurate the way you know um yeah so it's it feels like an impediment rather than a help that's for sure Anna do you want to what I, I know you have thoughts on canvas I have thoughts on canvas <laughs> I mean, I just, yeah, I just disable a bunch of stuff on Canvas. And I, like I said, um, maybe I said this 
my distic I've used I've used Canvas, Angel, Moodle, um, like three or four other ones. They're all they're none of them are good. Canvas might be one of the better ones, but um, my distaste for Canvas was a big reason why I'm moving away from it and moving into Discord, which is more of like creating a community rather than tracking things like grades and stuff. So I still use Canvas just for describing things in the class to kind of hold assignments and also students can submit their work there because that's that's kind of the easiest way to do that but i'm trying to use canvas as little as i can really there are lots of good questions in the chat hopefully um i can read those out in a moment um but go ahead maya and thanks for putting your digital hand up jesse i saw your <laughs> saw your regular hand so you can go next Did you you want me to go oh, first or Maya? Oh, sorry, Maya, go ahead, okay. Maya, and then Jesse after. Sorry, that was confusing. Uh, totally fine. Uh, my internet may be a little bit unstable, so I hope I don't start cutting out. But I do kind of wanted to just follow up with what uh, Nora said about being in um, academia and kind of ha feeling like you know. I mean, I would show up to class every day, studied really hard for some test, and then like not feeling like my grade reflected the work and the amount of like effort I was putting in, it really kind of makes you feel like um, ostracized, you know, you get imposter syndrome. And I think a lot of our students feel that way when we kind of grade in that same similar manner, like you need to study tests, you need to test well in a time frame or whatnot. Um, and that is something that really came up with me, even, even going and meeting in office hours and feeling like teachers like, well, that's the grade that you got. And that kind of like just sucks for you. You didn't do good, you know, and um, that quarter was really, really stressful for me. And especially being like a first generation student, a lot of these, we're navigating these institutions that don't make sense to us, that we don't have advice we can receive from family members. Um, and so I feel like that kind of, that's what comes up when I think about grading is how are we setting, like putting up walls? How are we creating barriers for our students not to succeed and, and to feel like these spaces are not created for them? Um, and so I've been trying to like kind of implement these uh, strategies. I'm still really new. Um, I'm like, I'm a fellowship um, awardee through Seattle Central, um, kind of came here from UW to create curriculum. And I feel like they're also trying to have me fit my curriculum, what a university standard would be. And that's not what a community college is. So that's kind of been a weird, like, uh, kind of feels like a power dynamic, you know, in a, in a way with that. And how do I show up for my students on this side? Because that's truly what matters. And so I kind of, I've been starting to like change my stuff. I've been implementing the no penalty um, for, for missing or late assignments. Like they're always open. I have like suggested dates, but I, I feel like that I've, I've had a lot of students turn in late work and I have a lot of students turning in work all the time on time. So I think that's been a great thing. Um, and I, I just, I'm so, I'm glad to be here. I can't wait to, I'll stop talking so I can hear other people's wonderful input. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I, I think I'm next. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank you, um, Maya and Norris for sharing your perspectives with grades. Um, I, I teach biology and nutrition and I've been doing, um, I don't know, I think the closest term is probably specifications-based grading, uh, and I don't do exams. I have um, all the assignments, they either meet the standard or not, and they, and I've been using the check marks in Canvas, you can mark things complete or incomplete. Um, that's like been working fairly well for me, although it's it can be really, some students get really discouraged when I mark things incomplete and they have an X in their grade book. Um, they, and it, and it takes a while for some of the students to get used to like what that means and that they have a chance to resubmit it. Um, that's something that's like so new and foreign to them that a lot of times they don't resubmit it and don't realize that I'm only giving them credit if they get like the whole thing right. So there's definitely, um, I think one of the biggest challenges for me is that it's really different for students and um, uh, they sometimes really kind of resent that, like having to learn a different way of doing things and um, or, or resent having to resubmit things that happens too. 
Um, so, but overall, I'm I'm pretty much sold on it. I think it's a it really promotes learning more and helps reinforce like really good student skills. So um, that's been my experience with it as an instructor and uh, and from a different field. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's nice to hear from um, biology faculty. Uh, I think people tend to think like, oh, English, it's, it's writing some papers. Um, so it's nice to hear that like there are opportunities for all faculty to do and incorporate this work. Um, David, I'm wondering if you want to say your question slash comment in the chat. I'm happy to read it also, but would love to hear from you if you're able to unmute. Hi, all. Uh, first, uh, thanks to the organizers, uh, Aaron and Anna, for uh, this presentation. These are uh, very sort of new ideas, having just come from a very uh, traditional academic setting. Uh, now I'm at South Seattle College, but sort of I'm, I teach history and, and I have a very sort of analytical writing bent in the types of assignments that I assign. And, and so I try to, you know, I, I try to give feedback and I try to sort of minimize, you know, the, the sort of uh, bias that you get in, in terms of, of writing and, and writing expectations. But at the same time, you know, I, I want to sort of, you know, getting back to my comment is, is I want to make sure that I give students adequate feedback in a timely manner, as well as sort of leave myself enough time throughout the quarter to evaluate their assignments, get them that feedback so that they can implement that feedback for assignments that come along later. So, you know, I'm wondering if there are any organizational challenges with sort of, you know, the, uh, you know, leaving assignment submission windows open, having no due dates in terms of adding sort of many more extra hours to your own workload of sort of having to constantly log in to see, okay, did this student put this, you know, add this assignment in, did this student, add, you know, send their assignment in, you know, if, if things are sort of trickling in, how do you chunk, how do you sort of block out the, the grading time so you're, you're able to get them that feedback in a timely manner and, and also, you know, make sure you're leaving yourself time for all your prep and everything else that you, you have to get done. So uh, with that, I'll uh, go ahead and mute and, and thanks for your responses. I could start on that one. Um, I don't, so the, the system that I am working out for myself, I don't know if it'll work for everybody, um, but it's what's working pretty well for me so far. Um, the way that I'm doing it the last couple of quarters is that I actually have less turned in. Um, I, I recently got an ADHD diagnosis and also realized that I was just spending way too much time looking at student work that they didn't necessarily want me or need me to engage with in depth. Um, and so the way that I've been doing my 101 class this quarter is, and last quarter, is that I will, I, I have things that I ask people to write about, and I see those that writing as a practice that they engage in. And then if they want feedback from me, they can submit those things, but they don't have to. And I, I always welcome them to submit it. Um, and some people do really want specific kinds of feedback, but I'll say like, you can turn this in and tell me what kind of, what, what you'd like me to pay attention to or what kind of conversation you'd like to have around it. But some of the work will never be submitted. Um, and what I do instead, and th this, is this is what has taken up more time. I'm spending a lot less time grading and a lot less time looking at what they're submitting, but I'm spending a lot more time in one-on-one -on -one conversations with the students where we might look at something that they've written or something that is um, something that I've assigned. Um, and we can talk about it kind of in person that way. And so I'm having students schedule one on one meetings. And then then I make sure that I actually talk to students one on one. And I ask them how how the journals, how the writing practices have been going. And they do then share a lot more. Um, and we get into a lot deeper conversation than I've actually been able to have in the past. Um, with history, I think it would be a little different. 
um, because there are things that you're looking for. But I, I, I do teach linguistics occasionally. And again, I, I think that with linguistics, I'm more interested in seeing that students can engage with the tools and the concepts of the field. So I don't necessarily need to check on the work they've submitted if I can talk to them about it and see how they're feeling and what questions they have and what what things they want to discuss. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, I'll just add to that um, in terms of uh, I one thing one change I've made over time, but like I really ask students to center like to, to request the type of feedback they are looking for on assignments. And so when I'm giving feedback, I, I really try to I may I may give feedback in addition to what they're specific, like what what they're picking up on internally. But I try to focus on the thing that they're trying to work on with a given piece of writing or whatever. Um, and I think, yeah, the more for me, the goal, the like the underlying goal is is about like helping students build a process, a process they can access and use for the English discipline and also all of the other types of situations where they have to write and communicate and think about what they want to say and how it's coming across to the people they're talking to. So um, that like building the practice is what is most important to me. And, and so I try to, I think a lot of, I do a lot more assignments now that are, that are oriented towards like mindfulness around the process itself um, and less around like whatever final thing they turn in. Um, but yes, in terms of Canvas, I do, I am kind of grading things as they come in. There's generally a lot of students that are turning things in roughly on time-ish, you know, and then there's sometimes, you know, work that's coming in throughout. And, and that does, depends on the situation, but it does vary maybe the kind of feedback I offer. Like, I'm probably not going to offer a lot of feedback on something that was, we talked about, you know, six weeks ago, um, unless, again, some situations warrant it, but, um, so yeah, I think it's just, there's some context to how you balance all that for me anyway. I've taught quite a few of the self-paced uh, courses at our college. I mean, one one course, but I've taught it quite a, a few times. And I think that it is sort of a, it's the same situation. Things are just different assignments are coming in all the time. Um, so. I do have to think about like, is it what, what part of the quarter is it? Do I need to like get this done quickly or do I have a little bit more time to sink into it? But usually I try to invite students into conversation as much as I can so that we can follow up more if we need to. How do I love your questions in the chat? Um, I don't know if you want to read them or um, not. Sure. This Thank is, you. you know, been, and thanks, Anna and Erin. It's been nice to come back to this. I know we talked about this last year. Um, no, it's just thinking about like my own experiences grading, and I think with Norris and Maya, it's very similar, right? Like if you give me a multiple choice test, even if I know the answers, just my mind does not work that way because I overthink it and I just did really poorly in those exams. And if I were able to do a presentation or an essay, same. And this just made me think of who does it serve? And I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, right? But grading only serves the teacher. It doesn't really serve the student because it doesn't matter. Like, and now I'm thinking about all of this, you know, it's, it's, uh, whatever as a teacher when I give an assignment I'm already thinking about my own interpretation of what they should know but I'm not giving space for seeing how students are interpreting the content right and so I think that's the shift of how how do you create space and less busy work and less you know grading so that you can see what students are taking with them and how they're applying it and if that's their goal and so I think it's just it's all those questions about control, power, and agency. Well, you need to know this by the end of this quarter. And if you don't know it, you know, like I, 
I'm gonna confess <laughs> years ago in my very first few years of a teacher I would say to my student I teach in basic and transitional studies I would say well if you don't know the perfect perfect present perfect by 5a you can't go to the next level and, this, and now that I think about it, I'm horrified that I said that because English does not work that way <laughs> it's not a linear steps of verb tenses and ideas um, so I think um, yeah, I think just moving away to allowing, like what you're all doing, like you learn what what does it mean to pass? What do I need to know so I can pass? What do I need to know for my next class or for my my goals for being in in, in school? So, um, yeah, I'll stop talking to you. Thank you. I just your what you said, Caro, made me think of because I was just reading some student. Um, worked <laughs> before this meeting, but one of my students was writing about how um, we were I had them do an assignment around anxiety. They're submitting a, a creative writing piece, and um, and just like you know, kind of like building some strategies to send that work into the world of the class. And one of my students was writing about how um, like telling themselves and reminding themselves, "I wrote what I can write, the best I can write right now." And I was like, "That is so true." I, I mean, not just you know, like, that's true of me right now. That's true. Of, um, just like, we can write what we can write now. We can do what we can do with what we have, with what we know, with the resources we have at this moment, you know. Um, and I, I don't know, I just appreciate that, that perspective. And, and so, yeah, it what, what he said reminded me of what you were saying. Thanks. But thank you for, I appreciate the, the point you're making about like, who does it serve and how, yeah, to, we can be, become very enmeshed with the grades as teachers and it's it's really problematic so i know there are some students out there and would love to hear from you yeah so if there's any students who want to talk about what i mean what grading feels like to you or or if there's been times that you've noticed like it felt really different in one situation or another or um when does has grading ever felt fair or are there times it's particularly felt unfair um, we would just love to hear what your what your stories are what you're thinking about lena go for it hi i'm a student <laughs> i'm in anna's class um, and this is my first time back in school for a very long time. Um, and one thing that I've been noticing a lot is the difference between like grades and structure. Like for me with my also recent ADHD diagnosis, I'm noticing that I do appreciate having like a sort of suggested due date type of structure and a sort of like uh, something I can follow um, with some sort of weighted understanding of how important each assignment is. But I definitely appreciate them not being like graded on a very specific point scale. Um, and at first in Anna's class, I definitely was a little bit concerned about not knowing how to do the best because I have a hard time managing the difference between 110% giving and like, I don't know, a, a solid 85% giving in a class. So for me, it's easier to understand like what is 100% that I can work toward. Um, and so I had a little difficulty with that at first, um, but I really appreciate this class a lot now and the topics we're covering because we're covering these exact topics in the class. I just wrote a paper about grades and tests. Um, so yeah, my, overall my experience has been amazing and I really appreciate um, getting to have my assessment be about what I want to give and not what someone's expectations are of me. Someone who doesn't know me, who's never met me before, doesn't know anything about me, setting the standard for me. And I'll just say that one of when Lena and I first had a conference, Lena had the idea of putting together a, like a suggested weekly schedule for students to follow. And that's one of the big changes I'd like to make for my next quarter's class.
Yeah, you kind of just blew my mind, Lena. Thank you so much. Um, I have one question. Um, mm. uh, sorry, I'm not uh, opening my camera, but um, uh, a question on if you wanted to not, I mean, I'm listening to all of this conversation, but grading um, seems to me is not as important um, is that what a students they are doing is important to you all. But how about clinical and lab portion? How do you measure those? Yeah, that's exactly what I was, I was thinking that it, it would definitely be a different approach that you'd have to take because um, it's a different set of skills. But I, I also, I think that with English, it's different, but with my linguistics class, um, again, what I look for is there are skills and levels of comfort with the ideas and willingness to engage the ideas. Um, and I can, I can, I feel like I can actually get a better idea through conversation with a student and through talking with them about their experience. Um, how comfortable they are with the topic than I could from a test or from a, a written assignment. But this, it's not, it's not my field. So I, that's not something that I feel like I can say. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm curious about the same thing. I, I think that's why un, ungrading is an umbrella that's not specific to English labor-based grading as I understand it, I mean, it can be used in other fields, but it seems like it's particularly used in English courses. Um, but I, I think it'd be great to hear from math and, I mean, STEM faculty in general who have tried out various other types of interventions, because I think it would be a little bit different. And I know, um, I think the, what I've heard from other faculty is mainly within arts, humanities, and social sciences, um, just because I tend to, you know, we, I think we tend to interact more often, but so I've heard of some, some types of ungrading interventions in psychology and sociology, but I haven't heard as much from math and science-based courses, but I, I think that that doesn't mean that they're not happening. I just don't know that I'm as like connected there, so. And I see your question, Maya, about, I, I don't know. I don't know what the, uh, like the lab portion of a class when there's like a lab that's linked to a lecture-based course. I'm not sure how that, how that works right now. Sorry. Maybe other, there might be other faculty that can answer that. I, I could speak briefly to that. I teach lab classes. Um, uh, traditionally, a lab is a certain percentage of your grade in a, in a lab class. Um, I generally require complete on almost all the labs. So they have to meet like a certain standard. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's like they have to get everything. Sometimes it's like they have to get like, I mean, I do kind of use like a percent on the lab. And I actually, I do quizzes that way too, where they get, they have to get seven out of 10 on a qu weekly quiz and then they get a check mark. So it's like completion by, um, so, so there are assessments, but I allow multiple tries and for the labs, if they don't meet the criteria for a lab, I will turn it back to them and have them correct what they missed, which I think is superior because otherwise they could get like seven, six out of 10 on a lab and like miss, like miss something important. So I, I really like it for, for evaluating labs as like you either completed the objectives or you didn't kind of thing. Thanks for jumping in, Jesse. Appreciate that. I do like that question of like what, what, and who are the grades for? Because there are ways that grades accomplish necessary tasks, and it's, I don't think we would say that the tasks are unnecessary, but there might be other ways, like what Jesse is saying, to accomplish those tasks to see if somebody has learned a skill besides giving the grade. So I think that there's a lot more room for creativity than than we've thought in the past. I'll just add on one quick thing. Also, what I've heard from um, faculty teaching in like some non-English courses who use quizzes, like they'll have like kind of a maybe 80% or something like that, that if the student gets that percentage, they get the check marker, they get a, they get full, full completion credit. So it's less based on like 
the exact, you know, percentage they got and more like, are they reaching a bar enough that like, yeah, you're good. Okay. Moving on, you know. Well, I know we're getting close to the end of our time, but I wondered if there, I would, if there's any other students in particular who had any thoughts or comments they wanted to share, I would, I would sure love to hear them. Well, I'll just close with, um, I, I'll just lift up something that Lena said, uh, maybe to close out or something that stuck with me. But Lena, when you were like, but you don't know me, like that we end up in these um, learning ecosystems and, uh, and that we have these outcomes that are like, regardless of who the student is when they show up in our class, um, that like, you don't know me. We have these ways that we're like, no matter where you start, no matter who you are at the beginning, you're going to end here. And I think that's what is being called into question here. Um, and I love that. And it's so important. Um, and Lena, I want to think more about like, yeah, about like how, how we start that out <laughs> and how I um, let students know that they're showing up just exactly the way that they're supposed to be. Uh, yes, yes, thank you all so much. Um, again, it seems like the conversation we've had here could could keep going. I hope that we can talk about this topic again. Would love to hear from um, math folks, folks where um, accreditation bodies are the ones who care about grades, you know, so many different stakes in so many different contexts. Um, and Aaron and Anna, thank you for the lift at this really busy time of the quarter in preparing that awesome PowerPoint. I'm gonna grab it from you and put it on the library website. And just nice to see so many faces of folks showing up and I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Bye, shout out Kyle, I see you there. Bye, bye, bye.